What's up again everybody, it's Carpo. I'm going to do a video here that's going to hopefully relieve some of the tension here that I have towards this DEA movement. All day long I've been doing a variety of research on these topics regarding the authority the DEA has to make drugs illegal as well as the FDA and their roles and their places within the society. And I have come up with several facts and figures about the funding that just blew my mind and that I would love to make a video explaining every single number and how much money is spent eradicating marijuana in this country. And I will do that at a later date. And I also have an entire list of um, basically uh, my plan that I have worked out here for the citizen version of an herbal alliance or rather a citizen version of the DEA to hopefully... Uh, take on a new role as as citizens to decide what we want and don't want within our schedule list. And a lot of people don't realize how this Controlled Substances Act started back with Nixon and before that with Henry Anslinger and the war on drugs is something that's been going on for a long time and has not been won and will not be won. So what I'm going to do in this video, and I'm hoping you'll bear with me here, Dare I not compare Kratom to MDMA, and I'm in no way, shape, or form doing this in this video. What I'm going to do is read you a story about something that happened back in 1984 that is basically a mirror image of what's going on right now that might give you an idea of what could happen even if we do get heard in a court of law about this Kratom ban, this emergency Kratom ban. So this is a story that I read a while back. It's from the... Uh, it's on a website, the Center for Cognitive Liber Liberty and Ethics. Uh, the article is by Richard Glenn Boyer, or Boyer. I hope he wouldn't mind me reading this. Um, this is a very good glimpse into really the fact that we're not cared about by uh, our opinions don't matter and why they don't want public comment on this, okay? So, the first casualty of war in war is truth. <laughs> wrote the Greek playwright and poet Achilles. Okay, so I'm going to try to skip to the main points on this. I don't want to read the whole article and waste too much time. First synthesized by the Merck Pharmaceutical Firm in 1912, but never marketed by the company, MDMA resurfaced in the early 1970s. With its short duration and unique characteristics for reliability, heightening the capacity for introspection and self-acceptance, coupled with the easing of communication anxieties, MDMA soon caught the ear of psychotherapists, who quietly began using the then legal but unapproved drug as an adjunct to therapy. They had been using it as a therapeutic tool to help people overcome PTSD problems in their lives. One such psychiatrist was Dr. George Greer. Colleagues of Dr. Greer discovered that MDMA facilitated the therapeutic process. After spending a few months researching the laws and regulations, Dr. Greer concluded that if he manufactured the MDMA himself, and had a peer-reviewed and informed consent that he could legally administer MDMA to his patients. He proceeded to synthesize a batch of MDMA with the assistance of Dr. Alexander Shulgin, Ph.D., and administered it to about 80 people over a five-year period. Although none of the patients to whom Dr. Greer administered MDMA suffered from disabling psychi psychiatric conditions, he excluded such patients for safety reasons, well over 90% reported benefits that they considered significant. These included improvement of communication and intimacy during the sessions with spouses and a general decrease in psychological problems afterward. Interpersonal relationships, self-esteem, and mood also generally improved. Many patients reported that these improvements in their lives lasted from weeks to years, even after one or two sessions utilizing MDMA. Okay, now this is where it gets bad. At the same time Dr. Greer, uh, uh, that Dr. Greer and a growing number of other psychotherapists were finding it useful, recreational use of the drug was growing. In 1981, an underground manufacturer of MDMA gave it the marketing moniker Ecstasy, and recreational use ballooned. Word of MDMA soon reached the DEA, which, in 1982, opened a file on the drug. So, here we go. It's 12 years later, 1982. file is opened on the drug. In the July 27, 1984 issue of the Federal Register, the DEA announced that it was moving to add MDMA to the list of Schedule I substances. 
The notice stated that MDMA had no legitimate medical use or manufacturer in the USA, was responsible for an undisclosed number of trips to emergency rooms, and had a high potential for abuse. Dr. Greer and other psychiatrists who were using MDMA in therapy were alarmed when they learned of the DEA's intention to place it in Schedule 1. Dr. Greer and 15 other medical professionals wrote the DEA, explaining that in their professional experience, MDMA had proven to be a tremendous aid to therapy and could be used safely under medical supervision. Placing MDMA in Schedule 1 would make it all but impossible for anyone, medical professional included, to use the substance in therapy. Not one person wrote, to support the DEA's intention to place MDMA in Schedule 1. I'll read that again. Not one person wrote to support the DEA's intention to place this in Schedule 1. Here we have 15 medical professionals telling the DEA, you should not be doing this. And they're doing it anyway. Well, you would think that maybe they would hold a meeting. Maybe they would have a conference. Well, here's what happened. <clears throat> As a result of the doctor's letters, the DEA was forced to hold hearings on the matter of MDMA's proposed scheduling. Nine days of hearings were held in three cities during 1985. At the hearings, 33 witnesses testified and 95 exhibits were received into evidence. Psychiatrists testified that the drug was an invaluable therapeutic adjunct that was safe when used under professional supervision. Witnesses for the DEA countered that the psychiatrists were by basing their testimony on nothing but anecdotes, that no controlled scientific study existed to support their claims. Well, let me tell you, if psychiatrists are the ones who are utilizing this to understand their patients, and their patients are reporting the results, this is not anecdotal evidence. You cannot have scientific evidence to whether or not a person has had a life-changing experience. You cannot have scientific proof that someone has been moved or cured their relationship. These are things that are reported, and they're taking this out of context. Anecdotal evidence is irrelevant in this case. So, <laughs> shortly before the first hearing date, President Reagan appointed a new administrator of the DEA. The appointee, John Lawn, had a long history of an upper-level special agent in the FBI, but like other DEA administrators, absolutely no medical training or experience. Go figure, right? In a remarkably unabashed slap to the hearing process that was already underway, the new administrator, acting under the emergency scheduling powers, which is what's happening now with Kratom, unilaterally declared that, effective July 1st, 1985, MDMA would be a Schedule One drug. Administrator Lon stated that notwithstanding the ongoing hearing on the issue of MDMA's appropriate status, emergency schedule was necessary to avoid an imminent hazard to the public safety. The exact wording, of course, that's used in the clause on this particular Kratom ban. Over the next ten months, however, the facts about MDMA were heard by Judge Francis Young, who presided over the hearings. After receiving and considering all the evidence admitted during the hearings, Judge Young issued his findings and the recommendations on May 22, 1986. In a comprehensive opinion, Judge Young found that MDMA did not meet one, a single one of the three criteria necessary for placement in Schedule 1. Judge Young reported that MDMA had a safe and accepted medical use in the U.S. under medical supervision. Furthermore, he found that the evidence failed to establish that MDMA had a high potential for abuse. Based on his thorough examination of the evidence, Judge Young recommended that MDMA be placed in Schedule 3, which would allow doctors to use it in therapy and prescribe it, while still keeping it unavailable to the public at large. Administrator Lon refused to accept Judge Young's recommendation. In Administrator Lon's opinion, because MDMA was not an FDA-approved drug, it lacked both any currently accepted medical use and treatment and an accepted safety for use under medical supervision. Administrator Lon also averred that Judge Young gave too much weight to the testimony and evidence of doctors and patients. Let me back up for a minute. This is the administrator of the DEA who has no formal medical training, knows absolutely nothing about the things that he's supposed to be enforcing. And he's saying that the judge gave too much weight to the evidence that was presented by the doctors and patients. Who else provides testimony in a case where we're talking about something that helps people? 
this kind of shit is ludicrous. Pardon my language, but, you know, it's frustrating that people are so ignorant as to take this and allow this to happen. Um, <laughs> wow, you know? Um, <laughs> so, here's what happens. <laughs> I lost my place because I was frustrated. Yes. Um, he refused to do it. Okay. Um, Administrator Lawn also adverved that, adverred that Young, Judge Young gave too much weight to the testimony and evidence of doctors and patients and not enough consideration to studies on rats or the lack of FDA approval. So what he's using is a misnomer. The lack of FDA approval. Okay, well, that's because it hasn't been given because it hasn't been asked for yet. But it becomes irrelevant. In a flat rejection of Jung Young, Judge Young's recommendation, Administrator Lawn decreed that effective November 13, 1986, MDA would be permanently placed in Schedule 1, not Schedule 3. The medical community fired back. Lester Grinspoon, an associate professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, sued the DEA, seeking to invalidate MDMA's Schedule 1 status. The Federal Circuit Court that heard the case succinctly summarized the competing arguments the DEA reads, accepted medical use to mean that the FDA must have approved the drug for interstate marketing. Dr. Grinspoon, on the other hand, prefers to interpret accepted as meaning that the medical community generally agrees that the drug has a medical use and can be used safely under medical supervision. We have the FDA saying, well, it needs to be approved by us in order to show that it's used properly under medical supervision. However, the FDA gets their information from the doctors who actually do the tests. So they're basically what they're telling is you is they're we're negating the people who we claim are the ones that we get their opinions from. That the ones who actually give us the information are being completely ignored. Calling Administrator Lon's argument strained and unpersuasive, the federal court rejected Lon's argument and sided with Dr. Grinspoon. The court vacated MDMA's Schedule One status and remanded the case to the DEA for reconsideration, prohibiting Administrator Lawn from making the lack of FDA approval the basis for his decision. Remarkably, in a perfunctory final rule decreed less than a month later, Administrator Lawn claimed that he had reconsidered the evidence and once again, but this time without absolute reliance on the lack of FDA approval, concluded that MDMA belonged in Schedule One. <laughs> Thirty days later, on March 23, 1998, despite clear evidence MDMA showed promise in treating mentally suffering people, MDMA had become a Scheduled One hallucinogen. Possession of the drug for any reason remains a federal offense. And I'm not going to go on and read anymore. It's already turned into a 13-minute video, and I think that hopefully that informs a little, a little bit and a few people about what's actually going on here with this Kratom ban. It's never been just about the Kratom ban. The DEA is a complete lack of anything, a complete waste of money, a complete waste of resources. They're raiding cannabis operations in my state and the neighboring state, both of which cannabis are legal. We have billions of tax dollars going into these programs which we don't even support. And now, not only are they throwing people in prison for cannabis, but people are going to be thrown in prison for Kratom. And I'm not trying to bring anybody down by reading this. I'm just showing that even if the people who really want to fight for Kratom go to the top, hopefully we can pull and change this and use this case as a, pr a precedent to show how horrible this really is. Because MDMA never got the proper testing. You know how long it's been. You know, that was 98 when it was actually scheduled. Before that, it was in the early 80s. So let's just say 86. It's been 30 years that it's been in that scheduled status. 30 years. And only in the last five years or so has John Hopkins University actually got permission to finally study MDMA again. And guess what they found? The same things the doctors found 30 years ago. It helps PTSD. It helps couples mend relationships. It helps people find out who they are. These are things that you cannot dispute just because you have a position in the DEA. I find it appalling that people are willing to trust officials that have no medical training. And I got to say, if they're going along with what the doctors are claiming, I can understand it. But you remember what it said in there. Not one person stood up and said that they it belonged in Schedule 1. A panel of 12 doctors 
33 witnesses, something like 60 pieces of evidence were put in. And one guy, one man, decides, no. No. This is what's happening now, except for it's not Administrator Lawn, it's Administrator Chuck Rosenberg. So all I can say is, Rosenberg, shame on you. If you let this go down, you're letting down millions of people. And I'm hoping that, if anything, reading this will give people the power to want to fight back. Not just for Kratom, but for the variety of things that are illegal. Cannabis, the states that have cannabis that is already legal. It's easy to think, well, we've got it all right. I'm guilty. Say, well, we've got legal cannabis, we can buy it here, it's not a big issue. The rest of the nation still suffers. You go down to Kentucky, you go down to Alabama, you get caught with a joint, you're going to jail. And that's the world we live in. <clears throat> people here in the Northwest can't stand up for people in Kentucky for their weed. People down in Kentucky have to decide if they want to do that. And people in Massachusetts have to decide what they want. And the people in Nebraska have to choose what they want. But we all have to stand up for what we believe in. And it's my belief that many of these drugs should be legal. But who am I to say? It's just my opinion. But if other people have the same opinion, they should damn well speak up. So, peace and love, everybody, and uh, have a wonderful afternoon. Uh, or evening.